widow. It still surprises me when I say that. I still find the concept unimaginable. I always think this is the sort of stuff that happens in film, in movies. Got that film Up, where the opening scene is this beautiful story of a man and a wife and the story of their life together. And then you find out the wife has died. I always think this stuff happens to other people. So this is Jamie. This is what I thought my life was going to look like. Jamie was involved in all of it. He was involved in all the birthdays, all the anniversaries, all of the celebrations, all of the parents' evenings, all the bin emptying duties, all the recycling being taken out, all the 6 a.m. tea making. Jamie was involved in all of it. Widowhood was not in the plan that I had. And I think part of what makes loss so devastating is the loss of that future. And that future is only really made up of these ideas and images that we have within our mind, but we build so much of the present day based on what we think our future is going to look like. And I'm guilty of this even now. My children, I delight in envisioning their future successes, the idea that they would do well in their schooling, in their future careers, that they would have partnerships, maybe having children themselves. I do so much today in order for their success for tomorrow. So what happens when the life you thought you were going to have, you're not able to have anymore? And this is not just limited to an untimely death, as in my example. This could be failing an exam, and so not being able to have the academic career that you thought you were going to have. This could be falling out of love and getting divorced from the person that you thought you were going to spend the rest of your life with. This could be something physical. Maybe it's a chronic illness or losing a limb, and you're not able to have that able-bodied life. Or maybe this is finding out you're pregnant and the baby not making it to term. What future have you imagined? What future have you envisioned for yourself that you've not been allowed to have? I still find it completely incomprehensible how I'm now living a future that didn't exist in anybody's mind before Jamie died, a future that I have built and continue to build when I couldn't even think about getting through the next hour, let alone the next week, let alone the next year. And don't get me wrong, I will always grieve and be sad for the life that Jamie and I did not get to live together. There are moments where it can still be as raw as it was the moment he died. And alongside that ache and that sadness, I think I've always believed in hope. Hope that I could build something wonderful again for me and my boys. Otherwise, what was the point? And it may not be the life that I initially envisioned for myself, but I truly believe it doesn't need to be any less wonderful. We do take these losses with us. And as cliche as it sounds, these are absolutely the foundation for growth and the unwelcome catalyst for change. But when we're in that dark moment, the future is a terrifying and horrible place to look towards. And so we have to bring it right back to now, right back to this moment, and do things in the current day that make us feel better, but also hopefully lead us to ideas on what a new future could look like for us. So I've done some research. This is a TED Talk after all. And I've worked with some pretty brilliant fellows on some ideas that we can do now in this moment that hopefully make us feel better, but also lead to hopefully a brighter future. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Thomas. Thomas is five years old, and he's one of two gifts that Jamie left me. He is one of my miniature heroes. And he embodies my first point, which is to feel all of the feelings. We do not get over loss by burying our feelings down and pretending that we're okay. There is no stiff upper lip here. 
we have to feel all of the feelings. We have to feel that sadness. We have to feel that loss. We have to feel that devastation. Thomas does this with great ability. He lets me know when he's happy, and he lets me know when he's sad. He has the ability to tantrum like no one else that I have ever met, but he also is so joyful. Thomas has taught me that we've got to feel all of the feelings. I know in parts of my loss, I've honestly thought that I may not stop crying at moments, and yet you do become so dehydrated that at some point your body physically stops crying, but more so these moments and these feelings do pass. They do move on. We have to try and be a little bit more like Thomas, and we have to feel these feelings. What feeling are you burying down today? What could you feel more of? The next person I want to introduce you to is Edward. And Ed is the second of my miniature heroes and the second gift that Jamie left me. Ed is eight years old and he is by far at his best when his body is moving. Whether he is swimming in the sea, whether he's riding his bike, whether he's climbing a mountain, he is at his best when he is moving his body. I have always loved sport to some extent, but I've never managed to commit consistently to it. About a year after Jamie died, I committed to swim a peer-to-peer -peer open water race with a friend. It started initially as just doing a bit of swimming, raising a bit of money, but before I knew it, I was suddenly on the front page of a local newspaper and all people from all parts of my life were donating in honor of me and of Jamie and of the cause. I'm incredibly fortunate the event in itself was amazing. I was so well supported by my friends and my family. Uh, we raised an incredible amount of money. But more important than the actual event was the habit it created in me. This micro change of swimming, of moving my body on a regular basis made me feel better. Sometimes I did not want to swim. Sometimes I'd just take my boys swimming and we would splash around. There was one time where I swam and I was crying so much that my goggles filled up with water. This was not about getting faster or stronger or fitter. This was about swimming in the open water with the sun on my face, moving my body so it felt alive, and then going for a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich afterwards. Ed has taught me that movement, no matter how small, will always, always make us feel better. This does not need to start with the marathon. This could start with purely a walk around the block with someone you like spending time with. We need to find a way to move our body. We need to be a bit more like Ed. My next pearl of wisdom comes from the idea of letting your people in and comes from a group called The Syndicate. The Syndicate is a group of eight women in my life. I've known these women for 30 years and we play the lottery religiously every week in the hope of winning our millions. We then party in Vegas, we're buying mansions, we're buying Ferraris, it's really quite fabulous. So if we could all cross our fingers for tomorrow night. Um, but these women have been in and out of my life for 30 years. They, we've passed exams together, we've failed driving tests, we've got married, we've had children, people have got divorced, we've lost parents, we've lost husbands. These are my tribe. These are the people who, along with my family, of course, have held me in moments where I couldn't hold myself. When I was part of a normal family, Jamie and I could manage the day-to-day. -day. We had each other to console our problems and figure out solutions together. When he died, the loneliness in the everyday was immense. I needed people to step up, and I'm incredibly fortunate that they did. They listened to me sob. They kept calling and texting when I stopped replying. They did not judge me when I laughed. In fact, they didn't judge me at all. Now, I'm not saying the guy at the coffee shop is your person that you should share your deepest, darkest thoughts with. And you probably don't need eight people, and you don't necessarily need to have known them for 30 years. But we do need to find our people 
the ones that we can say those dark and scary thoughts to, the ones who validate it and tell us that it's okay. Those dark and scary thoughts will always be a lot less dark and a lot less scary once we've said them out loud. We have to find these people who love us, the ones who acknowledge our pain, the ones who then make us a cup of tea, wipe away the tears and the snot, and my favorite people are the ones that make dark, humored, and inappropriate jokes about death. We need to find our people. Who could you reach out to today? Who could be part of your syndicate? And my last idea comes from my brother-in-law, Will, to steal his saying, what does doing the scary thing allow us to be? And the answer, it allows us to be brave. There is something about experiencing such a devastating loss that has made me braver. I don't fear change like I did before Jamie died. I don't fear losing my job. I don't fear having to sell my house or to change a location. In the wake of his death, I am continually forced to do things that scare me. And yet not one of these anxiety-inducing scary things is anywhere near as scary as the idea of Jamie dying. And he did that. So we should absolutely do the scary thing. And this can start really small. This could be speaking up in that work meeting when you're a bit scared. It could be driving on a motorway when you're not that keen on driving. It could be cooking a meal for friends that you've never made before. It could be swimming at the local pool when you're not sure about showing your body. These tiny moments of bravery have a tendency to spiral into bigger moments of bravery. Maybe then it leads to quitting your job and finding something new. Maybe it's moving to a new town. Maybe it's going back to university and doing a degree at the age of 40 or 50 or 60. Maybe it's something as simple as being brave enough to tell someone you love them. So we can all take a breath. We can do Amy Cuddy's superhero pose. And we can absolutely do the scary thing. We really can all revel in the invincibility that comes from hitting the bottom. The worst already happened. I used to think so much of life was bound by the constraints of the life that we're born into or the life that we have. And whilst there is so much within our lives that we cannot control, I can't control life and death. I can't control when a train is late. I can't control what time my takeaway is going to arrive on a Saturday evening. It could be 8, it could be 9, it could be 10. We don't know those answers. But there is so much within our immediacy that we do have the ability to control. And this is not easy. There is privilege for many and such hardship for others who've been through tragic or traumatic events. And yet we do have the ability to choose how we decide to react from that point. Loss is going to hit all of us at some point. And in the immediate aftermath, it really is about survival and about getting through moment to moment. But there will come a time where that loss can sit side by side with a moment of happiness. And that sadness at the traumatic event you've gone through can sit side by side with a little micro moment of joy. And where the devastation of that event can sit with the desire for some rebuilding. And when we're ready to rebuild, I think we can all be a bit more like Thomas. And we can feel those big, scary, emotional thoughts. And we can be a bit more like Ed and we can move our bodies. And we can find our tribe of supporters. We can find our syndicate. And we can all do the scary thing. We can absolutely be brave. Our future is built on what we decide to do today. What could your change be? Thank you.